Good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Jones, as you've heard. Um, I was in uh, architecture and engineering for about 20 years as a principal with a big firm back in the US. Uh, and then I made the jump around the turn of the century into technology, and I worked for Primavera for four years. That was great for me, because that definitely plugged me into the whole global uh, construction industry, because nobody's doing anything of any size without Primavera in it, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I've been with uh, what was McGraw Hill Construction, and is now we're a standalone company called Dodge Data and Analytics for 15 years, and I run our, our custom research group. And that has given me the uh, unique pleasure to be able to study this industry uh, in a way that it's very difficult for any practitioners, and I know from doing it for 20 years, you tend to know the projects you're working on, you might know a couple of projects your friends are working on, but there may be right across the street from you the most amazing innovations going on ever. You'd have no idea if you're not on that project. You know, we're highly fragmented and we're organized around projects. Um, and we're all trying to do better all the time, but it's difficult to get your head around what are the best things to do. So what I've been trying to do is study around technology and innovation things, around sustainability things, around all these changes that are happening in, in practice, uh, how people are managing risk, how people are managing safety, how people are moving into lean, the various things that they're doing. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk today about the kinds of things that I've been studying around technology. And I've been fortunate to, for the last 10 years, been doing these specific studies, we call them smart market reports, about what's happening with largely building information modeling with BIM. Um, we do regional studies all over the world. We also do things which are kind of vertical. We look at green, we look at just the construction aspect, just the owner's aspect, uh, just what people are measuring. Uh, we're about to do one on water and wastewater. <clears throat> A lot of interesting things are happening and I'll call attention to this new series that we just put out because what, one of the trends that I'll talk about, and um, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues in refer to it too, is BIM capabilities have kind of grown with inside firms, because that's the nature of, of this business. You're working with different firms every, on every project. It's difficult to kind of get an ecosystem going that's shared around how to use models. And so there's been these silos of excellence that have been developing inside individual firms. The next wave, the real 2.0, has got to be about how we think about this as an, as an ecosystem, and no longer about how good your firm is and the people in your firm are at implementing BIM. It's really now got to be about on the project basis and then even beyond that into owner and supply chain and all that stuff. So I'll touch on some of those threads. Um, I'm sure my colleagues will touch on some of those threads. And so overall, I'm going to kind of give you a sense from our viewpoint in terms of the, the work that we've done, kind of where we are right now. We'll look at some of the things I think are the most important emerging trends to pay attention to, because God knows there's a ton of shiny objects out there. You know, oh, there's VR today. Oh, Internet of Things. You know, all this stuff going on, right? So I'm just going to try and boil down to you the things I think are, are important to pay attention to. And then I've got some, some concrete recommendations at the end. So before we begin, how many folks from the design side, architectural engineering primarily? Oh, a lot. Yeah, okay. How many from the construction side primarily? Oh, for once you're outnumbered, it's like an AIA convention. Oh, amazing. Um, how many of you are engaged in using BIM on your projects? All right, I want to see. I'm hoping. All right, okay. Oh, okay. So some folks really aren't yet. Okay, I get that. Um, this isn't going to be BIM 101, so I'm going to fly through a lot of stuff with some assumptions uh, that, that, that you'll know what's going on. So uh, fasten in your seatbelts here. We're going to go pretty quickly through a bunch of data here. Um, this transformation going from where, I mean, how many people have drafted? How many people sat at a drafting board? Oh, God bless you, yes, right. Scum X, 2H lead, all that stuff, right? Um, I mean, I lived through that transition from that to CAD in my own career. And so, again, this move from just straight CAD, which is really 2D dra uh, 3D drafting, g going into BIM really was driven by design professionals. I mean, in the United States, that was largely uh, Frank Gehry needing a better way to uh, manufacture essentially all those panels on the Disney concert hall. And he, you know, he hooked up with uh, the French firm, that, that, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That really got a lot of people going, even though it had been going in Europe for a while. That really brought a lot of attention to it in the United States. But it was really the design professionals. And, and when I look at this, again, everything that we do looks at things from the business value. What is the business value of BIM? It's two main value propositions. 
for design firms. They're both powerful, um, and one is that amazing ability to visualize, right? I call that getting to yes, because all, all of you who raised your hands the first time, you know what, how important it is to get that client to yes, because you got this much design fee, and if they haven't gotten to yes by here, you're burning your own money after that. You get them to yes, and they tend to stick, right, because they actually have engaged in it, and they can see it, and they can feel it, and taste it, and touch it. That yes tends to stick, right, which is great. So that's actually a financial benefit. And then you can, actually using all the analysis and simulation tools that are out there, you can do a better building. You can do a better job. You don't get paid anymore for it, right? So, but it really is kind of the mission of why we all got into this business in the first place, right? You can actually do a much better job. I mean, things as simple as deciding about siting, right, of a building. You know, every, anywhere on the planet Earth, the facts exist about what the sun path is every day of the year. All you really have to do now is integrate that into how do you think about natural light inside, right? And you can test the design. You can modify all the parameters, right? You can test the reflectance and the transmittance of the glass. I mean, you can do all this stuff virtually, right? You're just using the power of computers now to help you. And plus, you can see this stuff and show it to other people, you know? And, and you have science behind your recommendation, right? Which is, I think, kind of a knock against the profession so many times from owners is, you know, you've come to me with your design. How do I know it's the best one? Now we've got some science behind it. Look, this is the best combination of glass and, and size of openings and, and orientation of the site, et cetera, et cetera. Where this is going now, I mean, you can now at a molecular level practically do an airflow analysis, like in an operating suite, right? I mean, you can show the doctors, here's, here's the temperature and the flow, the, the infection control people are all about this, the mechanical design is all about, I mean, this is amazing stuff that you can now do, really putting science behind your recommendations on something. And then, of course, you can render it in just mind-blowingly high-def detail, right? So you aren't going to get that, th I did mostly healthcare. I'm going to talk about healthcare a lot because that's my 20 years of, of history doing mostly healthcare. You get that doc at the last minute wanting to make changes, right? Because they can't really understand what you've shown them. They don't want to look dumb. So they just start telling you stuff until the last minute, you know, they're supposed to occupy the next day and they want to start changing things. They can see it. You can put on the VR glasses. You can walk them through it. They're going to have no more questions, right? You can actually build what you design. And owners, um, we have now, as an industry, done enough of these projects that we're able to go out and start surveying owners and saying, you've done projects without this, you've now done projects with this. Is it better? And we're getting really, really great responses. We did uh, one of US and UK owners. And again, these are all free reports. I encourage you to download them at analyticsstore.construction.com. There's like 50 of them up there. And this was just for owners in the U.S. and U.K. And we said, in terms of the design, uh, what you feel, are you getting a more well-reasoned design? And we, you know, we give them a one to five rating. And these are the fours and the fives. These are people saying, yeah, definitely. 68% are saying that. Um, and then when we did this one based just on metrics, what are you measuring? Uh, How is it coming through? What's important to you in terms of metrics? Uh, when we asked them, how about the final quality and function of the, of the final design in terms of the fact that this was done with BIM versus not. And 93% are saying at least medium. I mean, this is powerful, powerful stuff. This is actually admonition from the owners. And of course, there's the contractors. Um, as this began really with design professionals, I think sort of around 2012 when Autodesk bought uh, Navisworks and started putting that in the hands of contractors and they began to be able to do virtual coordination and they were like dude what else can this thing do they have just they've sort of grabbed the seat of the BIM bus all over the world and they're driving the BIM bus pretty much from what I can see amazing kinds of innovations that they're driving because they can get immediate return on that project um, right into their pocket so we did a very interesting um, report, and again, this is free, it's up there on that site. Uh, we looked, just interviewed and surveyed contractors in 10 different countries, 10 major um, construction markets. And uh, these numbers here show what they cited as their top three benefits. We gave them a list of about 15, so pick your top three, 
right? So those percentages aren't that big by themselves. What it represents picking three out of 15, these are big numbers uh, percentage-wise. And all of these things are very difficult to achieve any other way. You don't get it by bidding the job harder. You don't get it by beating up the architect more. You can't get there that way. Those are all old school ways. Only by this kind of fundamental process change can you get these kinds of benefits. This is why contractors have gotten so engaged and con con uh, contractor adoption is going like this all over the world. I boil all this stuff down to one word because this is a crazy process that we do, folks, of putting up these buildings. I bring it down to one word, and that's certainty. What BIM does is it brings certainty to a wildly uncertain process. So part of what we did in that study is we asked contractors, we, we try and take frequency and value, and then look for that upper right-hand quadrant, things that are done a lot and provide a lot of value. And so we said, what are the top one's done in pre-construction and one of the top ones done during construction, all right? And so you can see here in terms of pre-con, as BMAL said, pre-con is so freaking critical, all right? The more you can sharpen your ax during pre-con, the way better construction itself is gonna go. And these top three, the multi-trade coordination, being able to visualize design intent, and then actually being able to analyze something for constructability are huge. And they're very, uh, they're, they're, you know, demonstrated here to be the three most popular and valuable all over the world in these 10 different markets. Now, what this can do that I think is cool is this can have a fundamental impact on the behavior of a trade contractor. I'll give you an example. One of the things we dug into when we did that study was we asked the general contractors all over the world to rank for us sort of the BIM savviness of the various trades. Right, how capable are they by trade? And here's how it came out. The steel folks, of course, they've been doing 3D for 100 years. Uh, and so they were very quick to come into BIM. They have a lot of skills in BIM, but right behind that's mechanical, right? Because it's so big in the space, mechanical guys got really good at it. And it goes down electrical, da, 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 down to the lowly drywall and ceilings contractor. Only 16% of the GCs said that, that in their markets, they deal with these interior contractors who have really much BIM skill. But it, doesn't matter that they can model. What matters is that they participate now in this collaborative trade integration discussions, right, around the model. All that matters is that these guys take part in that discussion, all right? So here's a specific hospital project, all right? They're dealing with how all these, I mean, you saw them all talking about how there's so much pressure now all the time against less space up there and more stuff's got to go through it. I know that from 20 years of doing healthcare, that's a freaking uh, uh, nightmare up there, a uh, traffic jam up there, right? Here they are dealing with how are we going to get all this stuff through in that one specific space. What the, what the framing contractor did, having sat in there and having gotten to where they trust and believe the model, because trust me, they never believe drawings, right? They were doing all this stuff. They did this. This looks very simple, right? But I never in my 20 years had a framing contractor who on their own nickel would do that off of my drawings. And our drawings were good. We were a really good firm around that stuff. They still, they'd never do it, right? They'd throw the rock up, and then every trade got up on a scaffold, used a claw hammer, pounded holes in it, ran their stuff through, patched around, it was a mess, you know, or else they waited until the end. All the stuff was up there, and they got up there with a scalpel and started surgically cutting drywall around it, right? Both of ways are stupid. This is the way cars are made, and ships are made, and airplanes are made, right? You get one component manufacturer, right, with the right openings, meets everybody else's, right? Interface control documentation. This is where we're moving now. We can actually have a real fundamental change. As simple as this is huge in our industry. You show it to somebody outside the industry and they go, well, duh, isn't that the way everything's done? <laughs> you no, know, it's not. What we're also seeing, as, as Bimal uh, pointed out, is because we can now have more certainty, that's driving both model-driven layout in the field and model-driven prefab, which are the number one and two most frequent and valuable activities reported by contractors all over the world, all right? And so you've got 
It looks like MMC, uh, which is a pretty major um, mechanical contractor in the United States. As an example, you know, making these, these kinds of racks that you saw BMAL talking about, bringing them into the space. The hangers are already there, right, because they've been put in from above, which I'll show you in a second how they, how they do that, right? But you're just snapping these things into place. Again, this is moving towards manufacturing, right? The site's no longer a lot of raw materials being cut and put in place. Now it's being snapped together in place, right? And those hangers are there because from above, right, working, you know all the points in the model, right? Everybody's signed off on the model. They've all coordinated together and they have certainty about the fact they can act on that model, right? And so essentially you're dropping in those hangers from above before you pour the stinking deck, right? Instead of coring through and all that nonsense, right? You know, right where it goes, you drop it in, then you pour the concrete. Hallelujah. Kind of like anybody who had a brain would have done this from the get-go. We never did, right? Because we didn't have the tools. We didn't trust the drawings. All right, and then you're seeing all kinds of amazing stuff being done by um, mechanical contractors bringing in you know, more and more complex assemblies of things that they can make in their shop and just roll them right in, all right, into place and install them. Again, less waste, as BMO talked about, right? Way better safety, right? Much more control in terms of what shows up at the site when, much cleaner site, all kinds of benefits. And it's not just mechanical. This is now happening with electrical. This is a big hospital job. This electrical contractor basically fabs up all, a day's worth of stuff in his shop, brings it shrink-wrapped in a little trailer off the back of, a, of, the, um, of his pickup truck, and brings a day's worth, all palletized, shrink-wrapped, and indexed by room. Like, uh, this, the site's much cleaner. Um, it's, everything's moving more smoothly. You can actually now do lean construction because of these aspects of BIM that people believe in. And we're seeing all kinds of this stuff prefabricated corridor racks, prefabricated head walls, right, in hospitals. I'm seeing um, mechanical contractors now doing, buying the studs and buying the jip and making these head walls, right? That isn't how it used to happen, but it's how it should happen, okay? So we're replacing what used to be with what should be. And bathroom pods, right, are sweeping the world now in terms of, uh, of productization. And this is generating actual real benefits, okay? So here's an example that we got from a big mechanical contractor up in the New England area. They used to be running 18.5% change orders. That's why owners are so frustrated dealing with us. That's like, imagine you bought a car, you thought you were going to pay X for it, and you got a call about six weeks before delivery saying, oh, well, that's going to cost you 18% more. Well, why? Oh, it just does. What? This is why owners get so upset with us. 18% change orders a mechanical, which is the biggest trade in a hospital. That's insane. They started doing what they call lonely BIM, where they were the only ones who would model. And if anybody else would give them their stuff, they'd model that too. Right? They would bring it down to 11%. But now they're working on these integrated projects where the whole ecosystem is working together around the model. They're down to 2%. That's real money. Right? It's impossible to achieve that any other way. And Turner uh, shared this with me. They track productivity, labor productivity, of course, because that's key to them. And the red is where it used to be in the old days. Uh, the yellow is the kind of uh, lift they're getting now when they can get the whole team working together around models. Huge numbers. Again, you can't get this just by bidding harder and being meaner at the site, you know, and uh, being punitive and all that dumb 20th century junk, right? This is the new way to work together, and it actually provides dynamite benefits. Um, what I'll show you as I go through here around these is, is some examples I think are real leading edge stuff. Here's a pretty interesting one that kind of points to the future. There was a contractor, a mechanical contractor called Hill around Chicago. They had a job to do a 60 by 60 foot chiller plant on a site. They would have liked to have three months to stick build that on the site. They said, sorry, due to the nature of this tight site, you're going to have three weeks. Deal with it. They went, holy cow. They had to basically reinvent the idea of a chiller plant. So they took the original model that they'd done, because they're total model, modeling for everything, and they said, how can we rethink this? And how can we now make this in chunks, in modules, in our shop, so that we can take it in that three-week window, snap it together, and have confidence and certainty it will work, right? 
So they did that. They basically reimagined that whole design now as something they could make modular. And you see here with the parting lines in between the chunks. They took that, they built the whole thing, they put it together in their shop. First, they fired it up, the whole chiller plant in their shop, they fired it up and they commissioned it to make sure it worked. Then they took it, they broke it back down from those modules, they put it on trucks, and they brought it out to the site. They essentially productized a whole 60 by 60 chiller plant because they had to, but without having that model, that would have been a really challenging thing to do, right? And so here they are, just trucking these big chunks into place, putting the architectural skin on it. It was a design build responsibility, so they had the architectural skin too, all right? Fantastic, reimagining. Now they're in a new business. Now they can do what their competitors can't possibly do, all right? What an amazing thing to be able to say you can do that to an owner and you've, and you've proven it. You, they're reinventing the business. You can reinvent this business by leveraging the power of these models. I'll show you another example again with that sort of that lowly interior contractor, All right? This is um, having that certainty, doing that layout in the field and the prefab, and then using augmented reality as another level of certainty. All right, so you have DPR. If you haven't heard of them, they're a, a general contractor in the US, really leading light folks. They self-perform their interior construction. Very important to them to do that, and they do a lot of healthcare. So here's a, a plan, all right, a, a, a 3D version of a plan. I did these for years, and I would just toss them over the fence to the general contractor. They would have somebody sitting there doing takeoffs and how much drywall, how many studs. They'd be shipping pallets of drywall to the site. They'd be shipping big stacks of studs. Everybody would be cutting and framing on the site, firing things into the, it would be, you know, build on site kind of thing. They said, no, no, we're going to do this a whole nother way. So they reimagined, just like Hill reimagined the chiller plant, they reimagined interior construction as all stuff you can do in your shop on what they call a post and panel system. And they are completely devoted to modeling. So of course, everything is coordinated with a model. All the final equipment, all the utilities, everything that has to be there is all coordinated in that model so that they have certainty when they make these parts and pieces and put them in that it's going to be correct. They also use a robotic layout tool, right? They don't have you know, monkeys doing chalk lines anymore. They're basically running that off the model and they're laying out the whole floor. Then once they get all that, all the, the, the prefab frame pieces up, they'll go through and use this augmented reality technique where essentially whatever they're looking at, they're overlaying directly from the model wirelessly, right, what the final equipment is, what the doors and everything are to make sure, again, before you put that rock up, all right, you know you've got it right. Because once you put the rock up, then the vinyl goes on it, and the flooring goes in, and the base goes in, and the handrails go in, and the ceilings are in, and then the last guy comes in to stick the sink in, and it doesn't fit. And you got seven trades who have to come back for a change order, and that gets us back to that 18% change order nonsense we were in before, right? Certainty. Using relatively simple tools and thinking, but you're rethinking how you do it. So let me, let me give you a, a sense of some of the things that that we see going on that I'm gonna to recommend to you are worth paying some attention to. And one of them is, is this idea of reality capture. Um, now, laser scanning to capture existing conditions and laser scanning to validate during construction, neither one of them scored terribly high in terms of their frequency right now, so they're emerging, right? So these are, these are the things that I'm gonna to point to that I know, I guarantee you, are gonna be huge in this industry, right? But they're still relatively low. Um, how many of you get involved in laser scanning for existing conditions? Oh, okay, some of you, good. Um, anybody recognize this building by any chance? New York Knicks, ring a bell? This is Madison Square Garden, all right? 1960s, Turner got the job to renovate the whole thing. Guess what shape the as-built drawings were in? Ha, 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 right? They didn't exist. So they said, all right, we could send around a whole bunch of monkeys with cameras and tape measures and stuff for a couple of months, or we could spend six weeks and we could laser scan the whole thing. They laser scanned the whole thing, the whole exterior, the whole interior of all of Madison Square Garden in a six week period of time. So they had to a nano 16th of an inch uh, accuracy, 
all the existing conditions to deal with in a massive structure like Madison Square Garden. Now, of course, the scan itself has no intelligence in it. You have to add that. It doesn't know the difference between a beam and a duct. It just has geometry. All right, but once you bring that into your modeling environment, in this case, the used Revit, um, and you add that intelligence, now you have an actual model-ready as-built. What a fantastic way to work on this project, right? The other thing that I'm seeing happening is this idea of scanning during construction and comparing to the model to make sure, again, certainty, right? Before you pour the deck, let's make sure all the penetrations are in the right place. This is a hospital job. As, as uh, any of you who work on those know, there's a million penetrations in a typical uh, deck, right, before you pour the concrete. If, if any of them are in the wrong position, it's, you're in a world of hurt later when that guy shows up at the sink and it's in the wrong place. So, hey, you've got the model of what it's supposed to be. Take a scan of the, all those penetrations prior to uh, pouring the concrete on the deck. You know, and in this case, lo and behold, all right, two of those toilets were 12 inches off. That would have been an ugly call to get when the guy showed up with the toilets and they were in the wrong place way later after everything had already been installed all around it. That's ripping out stuff again, right? Great way to get ahead of it. So again, now I'm going to show you what I think is sort of the current state of the art in terms of what I've seen of this. Um, I can't tell you who this client is. I'm not allowed to. But I can tell you it's the biggest chip maker in the world, and I don't mean Frito-Lay. So if you can put that together, all right, what, who might make chips? Um, these guys, to them, speed to market is everything. So they're working with my friends at Hensel Phelps. Typically, it's going to take three years to put up one of these chip manufacturing facilities. They said, how can we cut that in half? And they went, well, uh, you point to where you want it to go. We're going to start building, all right? And we're going to scan this every day at the end of construction to, so we know exactly what we now have as current conditions and we will model overnight what the guys have to build the next day, right? They did design build in real time on that site and indeed they didn't quite do it in half the time, they did it in about 20 months. Guess whose phone doesn't ring anymore? The old people who still want to do it the old way. Guess whose phone rings off the hook now is the people who can go to an owner and say, I can do this for you. Boom, huge competitive advantage because you were bold enough to use the tools at your disposal and rethink how something could be done instead of going, oh, we can't do that. Oh, I'll have to put overtime on that. And no, uh-uh. Use the technology as a competitive weapon. BIM and safety. Uh, we're committed to safety. We've done five different studies on the state of, of safety. Again, uh, please go to that analytics store, construction.com, download some of those. Um, it's been a slow thing to actually see BIM and safety come through. Um, as you can see here, it scored lowest in terms of frequency. Um, but let me show you that there are people doing some interesting things. Uh, there's a tool called Celebri, which is a model checker. Turner uses that. The BIM, uh, the safety manager, has to actually put their safety plan into Celebri and run it using the structural model. Um, on, this, on a project and it'll run through and it'll actually check against the business rules because what Celebri does is it basically checks against whatever business rules you put in it, right? How many feet to an opening? How many feet to a fire extinguisher? You make sure all the things that are in Turner's safety plan are actually showing up. Uh, DPR, uh, the folks I talked about before, they're using, since they are so committed to 4D, having their schedule tied in, they can look on any day when they know they're going to be bringing in a pallet of drywall Right? They know exactly how much is going to be built that day already and the conditions that they're going to be dealing with. So they're actually able to simulate what it's going to be like to bring in that pallet of drywall on day 212 onto floor number six because they know exactly where they'll be on that day. And they can identify any of the tight turning corners, any of the safety uh, issues that they may have. They've got the model. And this is why I talk about uh, contractors are really doing all this innovative stuff. They've got the model. They're figuring out every day more amazing things that they can do for it that are really, really helpful. Skanski uses a tool called Redpoint. And on the um, using, just bringing up the, the plan on uh, iPad, if you have a specific safety issue that's come up on a short term, you know, in the dynamic world of what we do, right? You indicate it there. 
All right, so here it is being indicated on that plan, all right? Hey, there's a special safety condition here today, all right? All the folks on the site, all the workers on the site are wearing the vests, all right? And so here's that specific sp space. If somebody should happen to step in there, boom, all right? It alerts it. And so the supervisor gets, gets notified, right? So again, this is, you got the model, right? This is really pretty simple technology to put in place, but it's great for safety. And what um, Skanska does is they capture every one of their uh, safety violations and they'll actually model it in Revit and use it for training, which they have found to be a terrific tool. They work all over the world, as you know. You know, you deal a lot, a lot with different, uh, labor with different foreign language challenges and things. It's just great to be able to visualize when you're doing safety training. And they basically, again, using BIM, so you've got the tool, right? Use it for yet another really interesting thing. BIM on the field. Um, we believe that there's been a lot of advance in the office, in the trailer. We think the next big wave of activity that's going to be um, important for BIM is going to be all about the field. It's in its early days yet, though. Um, we did a, a survey just about job site and what advancements were happening. First thing we asked about was information mobility and BIM in the field, right? For the people who are using BIM, we said, all right, how effective do you think you are at getting the BIM, BIM out to the field to the people who really need it? Unfortunately, not so, not so hot. Only 6% said they think that they're really being effective, that they've, got, that they've knocked at least 75% of the potential value there. Most people are, you know, half or less. Right? Well, like I say, this is, an emer this is an emerging, right? So this is definitely going to change. And for any of you on the construction side, I'm, I'm pointing to this to your benefit, right? You can actually turn this to your benefit now. Um, an area that we are seeing a lot more activity, though, is robotics and automated machine control, especially around brick. Um, I mean, I love this one, where you essentially pour brick in the top and, and, and out of this thing is coming a ready to lay uh, walkway. But this is, this is fairly popular now, um, and a lot of the, uh, the things that we see is the, things like this bricklaying machine. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's going to put bricklayers out of work. I know bricklayers, right? All these guys have to retire at 45 because their backs are shot, right? What you want is, is what you see over here at the far right is striking the joints, right? Actually practicing masonry and let a dumb machine do the backbreaking work. I think this is actually better for the profession overall. Where this is heading, what the most advanced stuff that I've seen is about con bringing contextual knowledge to the worker, all right? So I'm gonna show you this example. This is, a, again, this is an interior contractor. Um, called Martin Brothers up in the Bay Area. And this is a, a, a demonstration they did. And as you see, this is not a young worker, right? This is a baby boomer, right? But you put the hollow lens on, and this person's used to working with tape measures and drawings, right, to do interior construction. Here they're framing out a bathroom pod. But everything that worker needs is being shown right in that hollow lens, right? You see these lines? This is what that worker's seeing right there, right? So you're essentially overlaying the work that needs to be done right onto what they're seeing through the lens. So it's not virtual reality where, where you know, you're in your own world, it's, it's hybrid. It's a mixture of being able to see through the hollow lens and then having stuff laid on it for you. No drawings, no tape measures, What they're working on now is since HoloLens, you're looking through it and it recognizes everything in the scale that, you're, that you have, you can hold your fingers up like that and it'll tell you what dimension that wall is over there that you've just held your fingers up against. This is the kind of innovation that they're working on. These tools are there, right? The tools exist. This is just a, an interiors contractor. This is not Skanska, this is not Turner, right? This is somebody who has a real world problem to solve and sees the tools and is doing it and they're killing. 3D printing. Um, we asked about that. People thought, okay, most people said, yeah, we think it'll be somewhat important. But again, I think this reflects the fact that it's difficult to see what's going on all around the world when you're just cranking away at your own projects all the time. Because have any of you guys seen this, which is what our friends in China 
can do. They manufactured with a printer that is 21 feet tall and 105 feet long and uses recycled waste materials. They did a three-story house a floor a day, $160,000 house. They did a five-story apartment building, it's the biggest apartment building, printed building in the world. This um, was the first whole 3D printed office building done in Dubai by Gensler and Thornton Tomasetti. And again, the printer was 20 feet high and 120 feet long, 40 feet wide, but they printed that whole thing. There's a guy at the University of Southern California who has this idea of a portable version of this, right? So you can go to a third world country or after in a disaster area or something, you can put up really decent quality housing fast using hardly any local labor and a simple material like concrete. Right? This is brilliant stuff. And um, Oak Ridge National Lab uh, hired SOM to do this portable 3D building. They, they uh, print the whole building, but you can take it somewhere by truck and power it by truck. So it's portable. All right? So it's kind of like a new age trailer thinking. Now, the cool next wave stuff is metal. Being able to 3D print metal. All right, so imagine all of the custom connections that have to go between an exotic facade like you see in, in Qatar and places like that and the structure. Everyone's custom, right? And that tends to, to limit your design, right? But not when you can make things like connectors, anyone you want to, in like, I'll just fast forward here, in seven minutes, you've got a completely unique shape that was made one off, one time. Mass customization. Now, these are guys in Amsterdam called MX3D. What you're seeing is structural strength steel being created from scratch in front of your eyes, all completely controlled by computer. The model is telling it exactly what shape to make it in. Structural strength steel being created before your eyes, custom can be a straight extrusion, and you can see how strong it is. It's, it's, it's coming out, or multiple at once. So what these guys are doing is they have come up with a design using generative design, which you'll hear about later, where they're going to build a canal, or they're going to build a bridge over a canal in Amsterdam. Here's a prototype in their shop with the robots that are building it. They start at either end, and they meet in the middle. And here's their somewhat bucolic view of the future of all this stuff, where you got a park and the family's having their picnic and the butterflies are floating along and, and the robot's quietly building a, a new bridge right, right next to them, right? And there's this idea of BIM and manufacturing. You're going to hear about this a lot from my, my colleagues. But <clears throat> the idea of being able to take something which is a completely reconfigurable kit of parts that's been well designed, right, and can b basically be refit virtually into any kind of building type you want. Uh, there's a company called Aditas in the Bay Area, again, in the San Francisco area. They are a combination of architects, contractors, and people from Intel, the chip business, because this is the way Intel does chips. They use a kit of parts, and they configure it based on the needs. So they say, why don't you do this for buildings? You know, we'll bring our thinking to what you do. All right, so they have a, a whole operational program. They don't ask about how many exam rooms you want. They say, how many minutes do you want that person to have to wait? Ten minutes? Nine minutes? We're going to design everything around how it operates, which is the way they do chips, right? And they've got this whole kit of parts that they have that are all proprietary. Um, of course, they're fully engaged in modeling, so they can bring the owner in and have them be fully immersed. And they've got their own factory, right? So they can basically flat pack a whole building and ship it to a site and assemble it on site, and they're doing this overseas. This is a huge project they're doing now in Saudi Arabia. All right? This is a whole other way to reimagine what can be done. And again, it's just using tools that already exist. They don't have to really reinvent anything. They're doing it for fun, not for fun, but they're doing it um, because they can. Uh, ultimately, we've got to be able to get at risk. Uh, we did this big risk study. Uh, the numbers are getting better every time we do it in terms of BIM impact on risk. You know, we're over half now with owners and contractors. 
The best thing I've seen um, comes from uh, Parsons Brinkerhoff, where they're able to take this 3D model, right, the 3D geometry, right in the same dashboard, you're attaching to it your 4D schedule, you're looking at six different types of costs, and you're looking at two different types of risk all in one dashboard, right, really bringing BIM and risk together. So let me give you some quick recommendations on things I would encourage you to think about starting to do tomorrow, all right? The first one is all about perspective. Stop thinking about BIM that's, as something that's used in your firm and start thinking about it as something that's used on your projects, right? Start thinking about BIM as a team sport because silos of excellence don't help. When you think of all the ways that value can be extracted from a model, all the different people who can analyze a model and get value from it. This is the power of BIM. It's no longer about you making a model. It's about how does everybody get better because a model exists, all right? So BIM's gonna become like electricity. It's just something that, you know, it's not your electricity or your electricity, it's just electricity and we all take advantage of it. Enforce BIM requirements, all right? You're fortunate here in the UK, you actually have a government mandate, right? We're just making this stuff up in the United States, a project at a time, and getting no help from anybody. All right? You guys at least have this, but you got to enforce it. And why? Because you definitely get better outcomes. The study that we just did about improved outcomes when BIM is used by engineers and trades, when you've actually enforced those requirements, right? the construction's better, the building is better, the project, uh, the schedule is better, the cost is, is better controlled. Right? Focus on driving these integrated digital workflows among all your team members. That's the magic here. It's no longer like you know how to make it run through your shop and then you throw it over the fence to somebody else. No, it's an integrated digital workflow between all the key players who, who are stakeholders and get something done. What do I mean by that? You think about this continuous multi-party flow. Think about structure or RMEP, for instance. Designers are creating the model, doing the code checking there analyzing it, they're optimizing it, right? Detailers are taking that model and they're doing the shops, they're doing the install and the erection plans off of it. The fabricators are bringing that directly into their shop floor fab systems. And that data goes back into um, the design model so installers can do that, that checking, right? That validation in the field to make sure that everything they're doing meets the model. Why? Again, better outcomes. This is what the people who are doing that today are telling us that they're getting, again, four or five on a scale of five. Better communications, better coordinated design, better coordinated shops, reducing duplication of tasks, more accurate estimates coming from trades, less impact when changes have to get made, and fewer iterations between architects and engineers. All really hard to achieve any other way. And then when the projects are done, better schedule, better quality, less material waste, as you saw from BMAL, improving the, each company's profitability and reducing the overall cost. And then when we ask people to look forward, where do you think this integrated workflow is gonna be giving you lift in the future? Better realization of design intent, all right? How about that is coming out number one. This was contractors voting for this as well as design firms. Everybody wants to realize that a design intent, right? Number one came out as we're gonna be able to all as a team do a better job with that. Better collaboration, more owner confidence, uh, ability for you guys to attract more savvy people to work for you, uh, completing work with less labor, and even potentially the innovative use of new materials. So there are great tools out there. Once you've got more people using BIM, once you've got the, the workflows, now you need that platform, that cloud platform, preferably, to actually get people to, to function better. And again, here are the outcomes that, that people are telling us. Reduce time required. Enables you to do more with BIM, right? Reducing the, the, the need to actually have a big room and pay for that when you can get people to work better virtually together, right? In terms of the better process, and in terms of outcomes, fewer project errors, more client satisfaction, and much better quality creative designs and projects, right? All good things, and these are from people who are engaged in doing this stuff at a high level telling you why it's gonna be good. Um, new trend that we're seeing here, equip your owners with one of these platforms. Your owner doesn't have it, put it in place for them. That engages them very effectively as well as engaging your whole team. 
So we asked about what that trend is now. And, and the folks who are doing more BIM than less tend to be doing it more. And so GC is more than the architects, but still, this is an emerging trend we're gonna keep an eye on, but equipping an owner with a collaboration solution, all right? And you look at all the, the benefits that are being reported by the folks who are doing that, the architects, the engineers, the GCs, and trade contractors. The client's way more engaged and better understands everything. And that makes life so much better. <clears throat> better relationship flows from that, better design solutions, faster decision making, and fewer design changes during the whole process. All really hard to achieve any other way, right? So in closing, this whole future that we deal with is going to all be about model-based processes, right? So if any of you haven't <clears throat> jumped into the BIM pool yet, you got to jump in the BIM pool, <laughs> right? And it's all about once you're in that BIM pool, it's how you play with other folks, the integrated data-rich workflows. And it's about the things I call the shuns, the collaboration, integration, optimization, industrialization, and globalization. There's no reason you can't be effective working on a project anywhere. There's no reason you can't work with Bimal and his folks anywhere, right? This is becoming truly a global construction industry, largely because we've made this shift into the digital present. So with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you, Steve.